It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. <laughs> I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I'm your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host, Bryce Johnson. And our super producer, Riley Bray. Oh boy, oh boy, here we are. Week 29 in quarantine. How's everybody (laughs) holding up? (laughs) It may as well be week 29 at this point, honestly. you You cross a threshold and then you're just there. I know we have yeah, it literally entered the zone where like time is now meaningless. There's mm-hmm. moments to this yeah. thing where you're just like, uh, where it starts to feel like, oh my god, I got a month left towards the, uh, you know, the government ordered uh, shut in, and it's just like, God, this time seems to be moving slow. But then there's times where it's where it's just kind of nice. You feel like oh, I'm going to take advantage of this uh, much needed time, and you know, so it, it goes in waves, man. Yeah, uh, there's it's peaceful out. People without people living, you know, their lives, it, it feels very like we we leave, you know, now once a day to walk Nova. We're we're going outside again, and it's just like, uh, it's so quiet. You don't hear any cars. Mm-hmm. You don't hear sirens. You don't hear planes. It's it's interesting. All I have to say is thank God for Animal Crossing: New Horizons, because <laughs> that's the only way I'm getting outside and doing work and socially interacting is on my little tropical island. Full of tiny animals. Um, speaking of of being quiet, uh, our dear guest is just standing by, waiting for us to bring him in. And uh, he's an awesome guest today, so I want to bring him right in. Uh, he's an author, a lecturer, humorist, and has been actively involved in the field of anomalistic, conspiratorial, occult, ufological, and paranormal research for almost three decades. You can wow. discover his work at weirdlectures.com and the podcast Realm of the Weird. Boys and girls, please give a warm Club Scout salute to Mr. John E.L. Tenney. Woo! All right. John. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Hi. Thanks for We're being great, on man. the show. <laughs> um, I'm I sure have you have no a few... idea what animal... Oh. I have no idea what Animal Crossing is. I'll just say that right off the bat. Um, Animal Crossing is a Nintendo game. Uh, this is a new sequel in the series where basically it's a sim life game where you are a little cartoon doll like creature living in a town full of other doll like animals. And you just do things like build furniture and and pull weeds. And I'm surprised you don't know what that is, John. <laughs> I am not a big game person. I still have my original Atari 2600 hooked up to my TV right Whoa. now. Whoa. Oh, awesome. wow. That's bitching. A little Pong. What's your game, uh, dude? The, what's, your, uh, uh, what's your Atari you know, game? Strangely enough, it is Space Invaders. My dad. <laughs> <laughs> That's not strange. My, 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 my dad, decades and decades ago, when I was growing up, owned a gas station, and he had a Space Invaders machine when I was like seven. And I, oh, wow. I knew how to. Cool. I had the key to open it up and play it for free as much as I wanted to. Dude, and you so, must have wow. been the most popular kid in town. That's awesome. I I was popular. That was when video games made you cool before they made you a nerd. <laughs> mm. I think it's come full. I mean, now I feel like moms play Nintendo Switch games. It's it's all become very, I think, like just there's the gamer gamer nerd culture. But then there's like, you know, my mom has her games on her iPhone now, like Facebook, you know, moms kind of ruin everything. Um <laughs> but uh, I, I, it'd be awesome to have a Atari twenty six hundred. I still have my old school Nintendo hooked up. Still have well, the blow uh, on the car- cartridges to get it to work. Friend of mine, I used to work at a comic book store with him. We have this discussion all the time, which is nerds won. Like this is the world run yeah. by nerds. Every major motion picture is a comic book. Everybody plays video games. Uh, people dress up in costumes. They love it. I mean, nerds won. This is our world. And so when you see people complaining about it, like this is what you wanted. Mm. <laughs> this <laughs> is what you asked for, you bastards. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. you were you a big comic book guy growing up? Then, if you worked, I I worked in a comic shop uh, briefly in high school as well. Yeah, uh, I was a super nerdy punk rock kid. Uh, I don't know how those two kind of combine, but no, the they do. People, I'm with you. The, the only people that would hire me, my first real two job, well, three, I worked at a 
uh, leather bondage store was my first job at 14. Nice. <laughs> 14. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, my next job was at a comic book store. And then my last teenage job was at a record store. So I had a pretty typical 80s uh, experience. That's awesome. What town did you grow up in? I grew up in a little town called Royal Oak, Michigan, which is 11 miles north of Detroit. And I still live here. Oh, wow. wow. Cool. I went to, uh, uh, I finished high school at the Interlock and Arts Academy in Traverse, near Traverse City, Michigan. So, yeah, I had um, a lot of friends that went to Interlock. And- yeah, it's a, Michigan's a place near and dear to my heart. Uh, what was the name of the comic shop that you worked at? And is it still in business? It is not. It was called Dave's Comics and Collectibles. Oh, in Royal awesome. Oak, Michigan. Oh, man. What was your, uh, what were your favorite uh, titles growing up? Like writers or. I I loved the Chris Claremont X Men years. Uh, that was my that, guess. But like, I really started off uh, with horror comics, with House of Mystery and House of Secrets, and Do You Believe in Ghosts? Like horror comics were my first foray into the comic world, which I think you know makes sense to me growing up and being a almost fifty year old man who researches ghosts and monsters. Yeah, I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. Like looking back now on like the work of. Like even Jack Kirby and Stan Lee back in the original Marvel years, like you as as an adult and having been exposed more and more into the realm of the weird to steal uh, to borrow one of your (laughs) phrases, like you realize how much like Jack Kirby especially was into a lot of this ancient astronaut theory as it shows up in the Eternals. You know, the scrolls are the shape shifting aliens that are, you know, there's clearly he was into a lot of this old esoteric and, you know, cryptoid and humanoid stuff that was happening in the 50s and 60s. I mean, obviously, they were obsessed with flying saucers and time travelers. So it's cool to see that a lot of those, you know, Marvel comics and the stuff that um, is so big in Hollywood now really has its roots in uh, paranormal influences. Well, I think that's one of the things that interests me, too, as I got older, was realizing how much fiction and nonfiction were joined together. I mean, if you look back and you're talking about Kirby being influenced by that stuff from the 1950s, but the people in the 1950s were influenced by the pulps of the 1920s. And the people who were writing science fiction pulps in the 20s were reading Arthur Machen from the late 1800s. And so it's like you have these science fiction, fictional writers creating these strange, completely weird, dynamic realms of existence. And then the phenomena seemed to follow it. Who's Arthur Machen? I'm not familiar with him. Uh, He wrote, he was an author who wrote The Great God Pan. Oh, um, interesting. Wow. Which is... Actually, I'm right now I've been trying to study trends of the past five or six years of fiction and nonfiction. And one of the things I thought was really interesting is so the great God Pan is about this woman who uh, gets a surgical operation and then she can see the paranormal realm and she goes insane. She witnesses. The great God, she witnesses the great God Pan. And it was at the time in the 1800s, like the best selling book in the world. People loved it. And it was this just crazy phenomena that swept across the world. Well, here we are almost a hundred years later and I have a, my friend, Josh Mallerman is an author in Michigan and he has the most watched Netflix movie right now, which is based on his book bird box, which is a woman who can't look at this thing that will drive you insane. And it's, Oh, this is the Sandra Bullock movie, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's a re it's almost a retelling of Machen's story a hundred years later. And again, wow. it's caught complete fire and just, you know, for some reason is sweeping the globe. That also well, it's sounds- funny that uh, I was going to say, you know, pan being back in the nomenclature. I mean, we're, we're, we're experiencing a pandemic, you know, it all seems to be um, <laughs> playing out itself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. People forget uh, that 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 name comes from. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the, the panic and pandemic is all related to the god Pan, the god of being wild and and the world going insane. So yeah. tell yeah, tell us a little bit more about the god Pan. You know, he also came up obviously in the second season of Hellier, which we've all watched and enjoyed. And you're in uh, your voice is in season one of Hellier, and um, and you show up in season two. Uh, that for people who don't know is a limited series uh directed by um uh oh I almost Greg said Carl Pfeiffer. 
Yeah, Carl Pfeiffer with uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk, Paranormal Investigator. So, because when you mentioned this author and then your buddy in Bird Box, it also recall, you know, it pulls up images of like H.P. Lovecraft and Cthulhu and the idea of like these old gods, you know, that drive you crazy. So what what is Pan's deal? Yeah, so he's just, you know, originally this kind of archetype for the shepherd god, right? Which is why we see him cloven hooved and and sometimes carrying a staff and being the wild man of the fields. And, you know, eventually when Judeo-Christian comes around, the Judeo-Christian belief system, uh, you have to say that that's one of the old gods because now you've got a new one, right? And then everybody that worships him or does something for him is some kind of heretic. So it gets washed out. And then we start talking about even like back to Jack Kirby, we start talking about old gods and new gods and these old ones go to sleep. And right now it seems like we're experiencing a, an awakening of, of people understanding not only the old gods like Pan, but just mystical experiences. You have more people doing astrology right now and tarot mm-hmm. card readings and just trying to find meaning in what seems meaningless. Yeah, and psychedelic trips are uh, you, you know are vastly growing too. People are sort of obsessed with this uh, you know ayahuasca and DMT culture too. Uh, so it's it, it's yeah. I think people are searching out mystical experience like uh, like never before. I think that's really interesting. I mean, for me, my path down this road, and we can get into that a little later if you want to, for people who are listening who don't know anything about me. I'm just kind of babbling, but... No, this uh, is great, we'll, and we'll definitely get into that in a moment, but I just want to love hearing you talk. <laughs> when when I got involved really in depth in paranormal research, uh, I had, well, again, we can come back to this, I'm going to throw it out just like it's nothing, but I had a heart attack and died when I was 18, and so I had a death experience And when I recovered from that and realized I wanted to research strange phenomena and what had happened to me and what I thought happened to me when I died, uh, the first thing I did was start trying to have mystical experiences. I Mm. studied hypnotism and magic. I joined, you know, the Society for American Magicians and the International Brotherhood of Magicians. I started doing flotation tanks. I started doing uh, collegiate tests. I, I would go to Wayne State University and sign up for tests to do sleep deprivation experiments. and. Um, doing controlled ayahuasca trips and controlled LSD trips to see what my mind was capable of. And that gave me a really interesting insight as I got more and more into talking to witnesses and people who had experienced strange phenomena, because I knew what my brain could do and what my brain could do. I assumed everyone else's brain could do that, if not more. Hmm. I was going to say, you know, your past so much, uh, kind of not mirrors, but it has a lot of similarities of one of the people we talk a lot about on this show, uh, John Keel. I mean, he's a guy who studied magic and, and, uh, amateur hypnotist. And John, do you have paranormal sort of quote unquote heroes of the past that, uh, that you look to, to sort of lead the way? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Keel has always been a hero because he was this jovial, uh, knew understood kind of the nonsensical nature of this phenomenon um so he is definitely one uh Jacques Vallée just because he was the one who really popularized the idea of you know combining all of the elements of Bigfoot and ghosts and elves and ghosts all into one kind of giant octopus Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if you go back even further uh, the original psychical researchers of the 1800s from the Society for Psychical Research were big heroes of mine too because they were ones that were just really sitting around collecting and compiling data i don't think that a lot of paranormal researchers realize that in the 1800s a book came out called phantasms of the living which is two volumes each volume is 600 pages and it collects <laughs> it collects and records uh 5000 accounts of apparitional sightings wow. and that that book, those that series of books ends with the conclusion of, okay, now we have scientific proof that ghosts are real. What do we do now? <laughs> right. And 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 then it, everybody just dropped the ball. Like it, it was like, okay, we proved it was real. Now we can stop studying it. And that's always fascinating. But those people are my heroes. To sit around, think, I mean, it was basically compiled by one guy, uh, Edmund Gurney. And yes, he yeah, yeah. Sat around. Yeah, he sat around and just collected 5,000 slips of paper and interviewed 5,000 people. I mean, it's it's an amazing task for back then. 
It's incredible. What What do you think stopped that momentum? Was it like hucksters who got into the spiritual age? Was it World War One? Like, what stops a movement like that? Like, why Why does it seem to be that there are so many starts and stops and all this stuff? Like in the '60s with UFOs and flying saucers, and then everything kind of dies down for a little while. Then it seems to cycle in and out every 15, 20 years. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's the the fact that the popularization along with it brings money and fame. And so then you get the huge rise of hoaxsters and fraudsters and fakesters. And then you have to spend a, a decade uh, proving who's a fraud and who's a hoaxster and, and who's trying to just make money. And so that's the lull, you know. And then mm-hmm. as soon as you've got those people sorted out, they've made their cash or they've died off, you can start again. And so it's just a constant rebuilding process and trying to get rid of the people who are doing this for all ill intention. Yeah. Um, I would also say too the, the sort of the science and the technological revolution really help, uh, you know, put a damper on people's mystical and paranormal experiences. I think we became obsessed with, uh, you know, technology, uh, as our new sort of, uh, God template in a way, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we see that too. Uh, in modern, I've argued this and discussed it at lectures for decades now, which is, you know, the the process of electronic voice phenomena, trying to record a ghost's voice on audio tape. This is something that people have tried to do since the advent of recording tape. And in the 90s, when digital recorders came around, people just immediately started using digital recorders and saying, oh, look, it works. And I've argued with people that what you're doing with a digital recorder is completely different than what you're doing with an analog recorder because the recording mediums are completely different. One is an yeah. analog one is analog tape and ferromagnetic tape re- reacting to an electromagnetic, you know, voice pattern in the in the air and the other is a digital chip that's measuring air pressure. So if you get a t- voice on a tape and you get a voice on a digital recorder, you have two different phenomena. Wild. That's so true. That's a really great observation and well well explained. Is that from the same source, do you think, John? Uh, EVP on analog and EVP on digital? I mean, it's interesting. I had a, a case up a haunted place here in Michigan, and I did an EVP session that was eight hours long, and I surrounded myself with like eight different types of audio tape, including reel-to-reels, and <laughs> like six, digit, awesome. six different digital recordings. <laughs> Orders. And then I went there for eight hours a day for a week and did these sessions and then tried to figure out which voice was showing up on which recorder, which recorders were picking up all the voices, which were picking up none. And I mean, it's it did show trends that it was it was happening more on analog tape than it was happening on digital recorders. But wow. something was happening on the digital recorders. That brings to mind, we just finished reading uh, the Mothman prophecies for our book club over on our Patreon, uh, the other side. And, you know, there's this huge portion of the book where John Keel's investigating these sightings and UFO encounters in in Virginia or West Virginia. And there's this like string of people getting these strange phone calls on their landlines. And it seemed, you know, it really brought to mind, like, I, I don't know if people get the same type of weird phone calls on their cell phones like the way that seemed to be happening in the 1960s with this ufo flap i'll tell you what's interesting is that there are still a huge amount of anomalous and strange uh characters making telephone calls to people all across the country but they're only happening on hardline phones Oh. What I, was you, gonna, uh, I was gonna say do you want me to start answering some of those unknown numbers because <laughs> i'm not gonna do it <laughs> well what do you think is what do you think is there is it why why this relationship between the you know the paranormal world or the spiritual realm or whatever this is and analog um or hard lines like what, what why do you think that's there's a connection there i mean i really i could I can posit guesses, but I mean, I, I feel like sometimes it takes the phenomena a little while to learn new technology. Interesting. Uh, and for some reason, that's still happening. I mean, we're only now starting to see a lot of strange things happen with cell phones and text messages, you know, that as, as this really embeds itself in our culture. But I still find it really strange that the majority of people in the world, and there have been two uh, studies done on this, um, but only two, which isn't very, you know, 
in depth, but uh, the majority of people in the world still don't dream about their cell phones. Uh, you almost never have a dream where you're using a cell phone or holding your cell phone. So yeah, that's wild. Your, your yeah. unconscious mind really hasn't caught up to the technology yet, which I think is interesting. Wow, that's wild. I, I mean, if I was still lucid dreaming, I'd love to run a test where I could, you know, go into the dream world and, and pull out my cell phone and make a call. That'd be an interesting experiment. I I did lucid dream once and tried to pick up my cell phone and kept picking up a book. It was very odd because oh, I usually weird. have a really great amount of control in my dreams and every time i would i could see the cell phone sitting on the table but every time i would pick it up it would be a a, a small digest sized book oh that's what was so the strange. book do you remember what what the title was or what the book was uh i don't remember what the title was in my notes from the experiment it just says what is that book what is that book Interesting. oh man that's wild so let's see, we've touched upon it. Let's get into your personal paranormal history, John. Um, I've listened to you, you recount this near-death experience you had, but uh, for our listeners, walk us through that. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it happens that young people have heart attacks. It's just not very common. And when I was 18, I had one, and I was down for a combined total of about three and a half minutes. They got me mm. back the first Whoa. time uh, with a with the paddles and the second time they got me back with a chemical restart. But um, there are typically three types of death experiences. The one that you hear the most about is uh, puppies and kittens and balls of light and everybody wants you to come home and it's really wonderful. And uh, you hear about that the most because it's the most pleasant of the experiences. And so people are willing to talk about it. The second most common experience people have is uh, being outside of their body and seeing people work on them. So they get in a car accident and they're standing outside looking at the car accident or they're floating on the top of the ceiling of the hospital watching people work on them. Uh, that's the one that you hear second most commonly. The third most common is mine, which is called a void experience or a null Ugh. experience. And that is where you become aware of the fact that you are the only thing in existence you have existed forever you will only be the only thing that ever exists nothing has ever existed outside of you and you are nothing hmm. is that lonely i mean is that a is that a, what, what, type, <laughs> well, I, what type of emotional feelings come with that so it's it's odd and the reason people don't talk about it is because it's super difficult to talk about because it's not lonely because loneliness is a thing that mm. can be experienced and you can't experience anything because you're nothing right um so even t putting it into concepts and phrases kind of Doesn't lessens work the yeah lessens the impact of the nothingness it's for me at the time when i came out of that when i when i was when i came back to life um I looked back on it for years as a terrifying experience. Um, and it, I still have a certain amount. I think most people who have death experiences have a certain amount of PTSD the rest of their life. But it took me about a year to really recover from that. I was uh, had super uh, anxiety, panic attacks. And the experience itself, I remember, it, if, if this makes any sense at all, and it doesn't really, but uh, in the infinitude of nothingness that I was, and I was there forever, uh, which is <laughs> very strange now because this talking to you, I'm in after forever. So yeah. forever, mm -hmm. forever for me is a finite period of time. It's very odd to talk about that. But in that infinitude, um, I became an idea at some point in infinity. And that idea was everything. And as soon as I became that idea, I woke up in the hospital. That's incredible. I mean, it sounds like more than just uh, experiencing a heart attack, you experienced uh, what they would call in um, esoteric circles, more of an initiation of sorts, uh, you know, a death and rebirth. Uh, do, you, do you think that, do you feel that in a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. There's, the, you know, the concept, uh, age old <clears throat> concept of the long, dark night of the soul, right? Which is mm -hmm. everyone's going to have to, mm -hmm. everyone's going to have to die and be reborn. It just unfortunately for most people happens to them. Uh, they don't come back. They die. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah right. Um, but there are those people who have those long, dark, dark nights of the soul, whether it's because of something that they're addicted to or some uh, heartbreak. I mean, you can experience them other than dying. 
but I do feel like it was a transformational experience. I be, I did become a completely different person. Wow. John, this this sounds like um, this void you're talking about, and I know very little about, about this topic, but I've been doing a little research because I'm reading Ubik by Philip K. Dick, and um, he's men- he mentions the Tibetan Book of the Dead a few times. And so I've been kind of looking that up, and this void kind of reminds me of that, where once you die, you sort of enter this timeless infinity, but there are these there are lights that sh- present themselves to you that you feel pulled towards. And the idea is to resist like one of the first lights brings you back and in, um, into the realm of reincarnation and just spits you back into the system. And then there's a red light that you're, that's very tempting. That's sort of this hellish realm that you're, you know, and you're trying to just hang in there as long as you can until you can get to the sort of higher point of, um, you know, a higher dimensional realm. Is, is there anything does, is that, have you found anything in literature or in theology that sort of is the closest thing to what you've describing what you've experienced? Uh, I mean, I do see it in a lot of the old religions. I mean, obviously they all talk about this other realm and the thing that is difficult for me to even now process, you know, almost, yeah, it is 30 years later, but is the fact that um, whether it be a, a purgatory or uh, a, a river of forever. Uh, however, it's mentioned in all of the old religions, like there was this other land to go to. And, you know, when I was in infinity, even though I was the only thing that was there and I was the only thing that ever could be, uh, I still felt like I was somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And for as terrifying <clears throat> as it was, it, as it was I, I, I talk about it in my lectures sometimes. We have a cross-cultural around the world, no matter what people's religions are, we have this uh, kind of saying of when people die, they go home. And I think that that is true about where I was, that I, I didn't exist for infinity before I was born into this body. And now I'm in this body for a finite period of time. And then I'll go home. I'll go back to being what I mostly have been, which is infinity. And so this is more like life being alive being in your body is more a dream than being awake if that makes sense mm-hmm. i mean you know it uh, mike and what you were saying too reminds me of you know uh ancient egypt's fascination with the with the dead and the underworld <clears throat> because it sounds like you know even as dick was describing don't go to this light it's a trick you use this one and beware it's like the egyptians had this idea that you know after when death came, you know, the journey just sort of began. There were trials and tribulations to overcome, uh, to make it to the other side that they longed for, you know, which was an eternity in the stars or something. And yeah, you could easily get spit back out and reprocess into life, but that wasn't the goal, you know? So, uh, they almost sort of prepared, uh, for death in a way and, and to learn the passcodes and the, uh, and the spirits that they would have to overcome. It's fascinating. You know, so many people think of once death comes, it's just, you know, the journey's end and you go into the light and that's it. But perhaps there's more, perhaps there's, you know, this is what we're, maybe this is what a fa- the fascination with this paranormal or this phenomenon is. It's almost in, in a preparation of like, you know, what am I preparing for when that day comes? Is there something I need to learn or is there something I need to know? Um, does any of that sort of, uh yeah. ring true in a sense i guess i think so i mean the again the the archetype is the journey not you know being able to go back and forth what, no matter what religion right. there, there's always i mean that's the whole point of hermetic magic is hermes the the only god that could walk between all of the worlds he could go down into hell and then back up to the land of the living however he wanted no one could follow him but he knew the tricks he knew the passcodes he knew the signs mm. this is it's even recounted in the bible jesus makes a journey into hell and then comes back uh, because he's learned that it's the journey. It's it's being able to not be too locked into one single experience, which is what traps you. God, it makes me wonder if if Bigfoot knows the passcodes. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. For sure, Bigfoot knows. <laughs> John, I had a question. Um, w- when you were when you're going into that state, did you encounter like any other form of consciousness, sort of on your way into that, or that? 
explained sort of this situation? Like, how did you come to understand this, um, this infinite nothingness? Like, was, was that just a, a knowingness that came upon you or, uh, yet, or was there something else that sort of explained it psychically to you? Like, how, how, how so, do you account for that? So there's the terror. The reason that I thought it's so terrifying after I recovered is because the pre moments before I realized I was in infinity and there was only me and I was going to exist as nothing forever. The, the infinite seconds before the infinity, um, I tried to scream and realized I didn't have a mouth or a body to scream. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that there was an, there was a terrifying moment when I realized that my conception of existing and existing in a body was gone forever. Wow. And, wow. and in that moment I did in my thoughts, at least, and in that moment, in that nothingness, I did what a human tries to do, which is after you scream, you try and block your eyes. But then I realized I didn't have hands to block my eyes because I didn't have eyes. And then I realized, oh, I've always been without eyes. I've always been without hands. Wow. Having hands and having, having hands and having eyes was something that you just did for a little while. Did you experience any sort of, uh, in this infinite nothingness, did you experience the want or the, uh, the idea to create something as in that sort of creator motif? Did you feel that you could possibly, uh, create other realms and dimensions with, uh, with the thoughts that you were left with in infinity, if that makes any sense? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a brief moment before I be, before I became the idea of everything and then waking up in, in the hospital room, there's a, a I have a, a flash kind of uh, in my brain from that experience of thinking about creating the world so I could wow. be back in it. Yeah. And then right as I'm having that thought, I become the thought of everything. And then I open my eyes in the hospital. So it's very possible that this is just the reality I've created and you guys are just playing roles in it yeah. <laughs> maybe absolutely the, maybe the mormons were onto something <laughs> <laughs> i'm not that wearing is... any special, i'm not wearing any magic underwear oh, okay well <laughs> maybe you should revisit that um this is just wild i mean so obviously this kick started your journey then into becoming you know a paranormal researcher an occult researcher um, investigator. I mean, what do you call, what, what do you have a title for yourself? Cause uh, I mean, your bio, you, you're not, I would say, I don't want to call you a jack of all trades because that implies you don't, you know, that you're a master of none, but what do you, what would you call yourself? Michael I, wants to know what's on your business card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> for a better way, much more succinct way of asking uh, this question. Says researcher. Mm. It, it, it just says researcher on my business card. Um, I, so I started off, I used to skip school in high school. I was a bad student and I would skip and I, I was bad at skipping too because I would go and hang out at the library in my hometown. <laughs> and that's not really what you're supposed to do. When <laughs> but uh, there was this older gentleman. I have a, my, my history is very bizarre. I have there, So there was this older gentleman who was a doctor who used to hang out at the library. He was retired. His name and was Doc he Brown. Would, he was, he knew some Libyans. <laughs> He, uh, he would, he would give me ideas on books to read about, uh, human biology and the brain and, and, uh, what it was like to be human. And plus he'd give me art books and give me jazz tapes to listen to. And, um, he I really started that. me into reading, uh, kind of deeper esoteric books as, as a teenager. And then when I was 16 or seven, 16, I think, uh, I met a, a teacher, a historian in Detroit, whose name was Craig Ciccone, who and his specialty was uh, political assassinations of the 1960s and 70s. And he took me under his wing to, as a gopher, to write Freedom of Information Act requests and make his telephone calls to the government for him and assist him with lectures. And so I thought that I was going to be some type of historian uh as I got older. And then I had this death experience. And when I came out of it and started going to college, I was like, oh, I still want to be a historian, but now I want to study folklore and magic and belief systems. And so that's what I was starting to do. Now to go back and, and do the, this is my weird history. Uh, that doctor that I used to hang out with at the library was Jack Kevorkian. Whoa. What? <laughs> 
That's, That's wild. wild. So Dr. Jack lives in Royal Oak too, which is my hometown. And it was always just a character uh, around the area. And I knew him because he actually came into the, the, the leather bondage store that I worked at. <laughs> he came in to ask if he could use our electrical outlet to plug his van in, in the alley behind the leather shop so that he could perform his first assisted suicide. Wow. Whoa. So he wasn't shopping Whoa. for himself. <clears throat> It's for a friend. <laughs> it's for a friend. <laughs> I just that love that it's mind that, blowing. I love that your Emmett Brown is Jack Kevorkian and, and right? his one point twenty one gigawatts is just the outlet to your bondage store. <laughs> oh man, that that's is wild. fucking fascinating. So when did you start actually going boots on the ground and researching cases in person, you know, um, and we're going to talk in the second half of the show here in just a moment about some stuff that you're researching in Michigan right now. But like, what was your, one of your earliest cases that you actually like drove out to a spot, interviewed people and looked for evidence? And to add a question to that, and why is that important? Yeah, um, I, I think. So for me personally, I mean, I had been already researching some weird stuff um, before I died because some of the Kennedy names were coming up in UFO lore. So I was already studying and Michigan had the biggest UFO sighting in American history in 1966, uh, which was the swamp gas incident. So there mm. were still a lot of those relative or uh, witnesses around that could relate the stories back to me. So I was already interviewing people like that. Um, but I think my first real case that I investigated was uh, a girl that I had gone to school with and she said she had a ghost in her house. And so that was where I really figured out how to pull property records, uh, who to talk to about who had owned the house. Uh, I learned a lot about interviewing witnesses and trying to discover, you know, what the history was to the house. And I think that's why it was important. It wasn't driven by like uh, this house is haunted, so let's go in and try and talk to the ghost. It was really fed by my ideas that history has to play a role, and a person's history is probably important too. And so I have to learn how to talk to people and interview people, and that includes people who don't want to talk to me. Mm. Uh, a lot of people now, they just will do an investigation of a haunted location and they walk in completely cold. They've heard a story about a girl dying in a place and then they expect to see a ghost or find a ghost or something. I don't know what they expect, but that's usually how it goes. And my expectation was I'm going to spend months doing research on this location so that I enter it fully informed and well-equipped to understand, uh, what part of the house burnt down? What doors are new? How many people lived in this house before? What are the experiences that happened in this house before? How many times were the police called? Was there any violence in the house? Like, So that really shaped how I still investigated because I wanted as much data as possible before saying anything to anyone about what I thought their experience might be. Wow. I mean, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, of, of Betty Hill and, and Barney Hill. Her her story really just just began when she when she got abducted. But what she started to uncover was was a lifelong, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, relationship with with the strange and unknown. And it took uh, it took property records and uncovering, you know, she had this dream that her uh, her place was uh, burned down or something like that. And it wasn't in the property records or I think I'm missing some of the details wrong. But like you were saying, it. it it takes months to sort of really figure out what's going on. I guess in television, you know, in in the format of television, they really don't have uh, that luxury. It's uh, do one episode and then it's on to the next. Well, yeah. And I tell people all the time, too, who watch uh, paranormal shows, you know, uh, so like the last show that I was uh, on Ghost Stalkers in, in 2014, um, we investigated each location for five days. Uh, we have, uh, I investigate one night for nine hours. Chad investigated one night for nine hours. We had four cameras. We were the only ones on site. Uh, we were the first show to do kind of zero crew where we, we were our own cameramen and everything. Um, but we had 
four cameras rolling all night. So you have four times eight hours. That's 32 hours of footage from Chad's night, 32 hours from my night, plus all the B-roll, plus all the interviews for five days. And mm. all of that gets edited down to 44 minutes. Right. And so like people watch it. And if on the first night you hear a door slam, the second night you get a weird voice recorded, uh, fifth night, you see a weird light. When you watch it on TV, it's like footsteps, door slam, voice, light. And people are like, holy crap, that place is super haunted. It's like it took four days to get three slightly interesting pieces of information. Wow. Why is that? Like, why? <laughs> like, are there locations that exist where you can walk in and there's like furniture floating around? I mean, I feel like some of the older, we experienced this reading Mothman prophecies as well. Like, it seemed like in the 1960s, if you went to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, or anywhere in the Ohio River Valley, there were just UFOs flying around every night. Um, why is it so hard to catch a high, highly active spot, I guess? you know, Are they running for a limited amount of time? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's always fascinated me. There seems, I mean, there is some kind of weird observer effect, right? So uh, if you're alone and you don't have a camera... Uh, you're going to see something like mm. it's it's almost this weird uh, awareness that mm. the phenomena has of us. I, I told a story one time I was in da- the downtown area of my city uh, on a lunch break and I was standing outside and I was smoking a cigarette and I saw this perfect kind of silver teardrop shape descend out of the clouds. And it was right over a very there's we have a really busy downtown district. And it descended out of the clouds and I looked at it and I was like, holy crap, like, what the hell is that? And I stood up and there was a woman walking toward me. It was lunch hour. So everybody was at their lunch break. And I I stopped this woman. I said, excuse me. I said, will you look at this thing in the sky? And she looked me in the eyes and she's like, what? And I'm like, look at this thing. And she, for as much as I talked, I must've sounded crazier and crazier because she would, she refused to look at it. And, (laughs) and so like, I, I let her go on her way and I run to the next person I could find. I was like, excuse me, could you do me a favor? And they're like, yeah, sure. And I'm like, could you look at that thing? And they're looking at me and I'm pointing but they wouldn't look at it. And that happened like six times as this thing hung over the city. And I'm like, why will no one look at this but me? And then it zipped back up into the clouds and I'm standing there and everybody's going around their day and my mind is blown. I'm like, what just happened that no one would look at this? And I look down the street and there's a a girl maybe a block and a half away with the same look on her face and the same body position as me, like, (laughs) like looking around. And I ran toward her and I go, did you see that? And she said, yeah, she goes, no one else would look at it. (laughs) What? It's almost almost like there's this block sometimes on certain people. I think it still happens. I just don't know why some people can't experience it. Mm. Wow. You know, John Keel felt that when you're looking into this phenomenon, it has a tendency to, to look back at you personally have you experienced any of that? I mean, do you feel, John, that the the phenomenon is aware of who you are and your presence and your your ability to sort of commune with it? Yeah, absolutely. I personally, in my inner monologue and in, in my brain, uh, when I talk about the phenomena as a whole, whether it be Bigfoot or UFOs, ghosts, uh, any of the high strangeness, I talk about it to myself as uh, it's a so it's sort of like a game uh, and you make a move and then it makes a move and your move can be not making a move and it'll Mm -hmm. still move. It it taps you on the shoulder and asks all the time, like, do you want to play? And then based on how much you want to play, it returns back to you. So if you fully engage it, it fully engages you or one of its moves can be to allow you to fully engage and then not give you anything to see how you react to it. And can there be danger in that play? Is this uh, is there nefarious motive, or 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 is this a uh, is there real stakes in this game? I think there are. I don't think it's dangerous because I think that this is just how the universe interacts with us. And you know, we have we bring so much of our own baggage along with us. We make mm-hmm. you know declaratory statements on people's ideas and motives all the time, and those are people who are physically in this world with us, and we don't have really good ideas about it um and so now when you're dealing with what might be hyperdimensional, uh non-chronologically oriented beings that you can't interact with when you say oh that's terrible that they're doing that 
you know, me dying seems like a terrible thing, but it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I've dated a lot of horrible people in my life, but <laughs> I, but I've learned a lot from them to so that it actually wasn't so horrible. And I think yeah. that the, pheno- the phenomena is that way too. Going back to to history, what what role do you think history plays in the phenomenon? Like, you know, is a ghost an imprint of someone that had lived before, or how how does how does that play into what you're talking about? I think that for me, the way that I think about history is well, first and foremost, it gives us a a, a nice little data set, and my goal has always been to set it down as unbiased as possible. But uh, and there's always going to be bias, but to be able to look back and speculate on what the experiences were that were happening and realizing that our future effects, I mean, at this point, I think that history is interesting. And and I think a lot of people have been experimenting right now with retrocognition and retrocausation, which is not only are my experiences and the things that I'm doing right now affecting my future, but they're somehow affecting the past. Mm -hmm. So what's been interesting for me with studying history is I can honestly tell you I'm a fairly decent researcher. I've done this for a long time. And in the 90s and early 2000s, there were maybe only 16 to 25 uh, reports of Mothman in the 1960s. We researched all of them. That's all that there was to research. And now I find new cases of the Mothman or things that seem like the Mothman all the time. There's hundreds of them from the 1960s. It's like they appeared in the past 10 years. And I think it's because I think it's because people are so interested in it now that it's somehow changing the past. That's wild. Wow. Well, is that one uh, of your, oh, oh. <laughs> no, go on. I, well, I was just going to ask, you know, there's so many facets to what you do, John. Is that what you enjoy the most is the, is the research or is it talking to witnesses or is it being on a, a quote unquote, uh, you know, active investigation? What, what's your favorite part of this whole process? I love talking to people and hearing their experiences. Yeah. Uh, it, there's just something about looking into the face of someone who is being completely honest with you. And they're just telling you the most wild, uh, crazy story that you've ever heard in your life. And not knowing uh, if that is just simply their reality and I'm missing out on it. Like, (laughs) you know, I, 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 obviously there are some people in this world that maybe aren't wired right, or just are on some kind of medication and something's not firing correctly. And, and they can say some crazy stuff. And I've heard a lot of it over 30 years, but then there's a part of me that has to ask, are they experiencing a wider and weirder reality than I am? Mm. Am I the one that's missing out? It sounds like you really have to have your, uh, for lack of a better term, bullshit meter tuned in pretty well with some of these cases. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, you know, when someone says, uh, I have a ghost in my house, can you come and investigate? And I tell people right off the bat, just from my protocol, right? So I tell people, uh, okay, write out your whole story in an email now, in an email, write it out to me, and and we're going to meet in two weeks at a coffee shop near your house. And don't bring anything except, you know, your wallet and stuff. I don't want any pictures or anything. Just come and meet me for coffee two weeks later. So they'll write out their whole experience. And two weeks later, I won't contact them for two weeks. Uh, Two weeks later, I'll go and I'll meet them at a coffee shop and I'll sit across from them and I'll have their printed out story and I'll tell them, okay, now tell me the story again. And in that first meeting with them, I can tell if they're lying because Mm. they don't remember what they wrote two weeks ago. And when I see in their story two weeks earlier that they're saying that uh, something tripped them on the steps and that now they're telling me that something pushed them down the steps, like those are very key indicators as to how a person is misremembering. Your, 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 your memory isn't getting better as you get older, uh, but your story will take on more and more aspects as you remember what you think you're remembering. John Tenney, the world's most skeptical Tinder date. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, well, I, wanted... <laughs> I, I had this imagination of like some lonely housewife with a cigarette being like, oh, I need you to come over here and check out the ghost in my attic, John. And like, right away. Right that away. Happens, <laughs> that happens too a lot of times. And you know what? Uh, <laughs> talk about having your bullshit meter up. 
Uh, one of the first things I do, if if I do eventually within, it usually takes two months to get to someone's house unless something really crazy is happening. Uh, the first thing I'll do when I'll go to their house is I'll ask to see their DVD collection. Oh, no way. Are, Interesting. Yeah, because there are a lot of people who have all 20 seasons of Ghost Hunters and all 20 seasons of Ghost Adventures on DVD. And that's... <laughs> That's a big warning sign. Sometimes. Yeah, that's a red flag. <laughs> or when you open it up and it's just 18 copies of Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> also a red flag. <laughs> uh, all right. Speaking of bullshit and red flags, uh, we want to talk about uh, we want to talk more about some of the work you're doing right now. But first, we have a game that we love to play with all of our guests. It's rapid fire. I'm going to go down a list of phenomenon. And John, this will be interesting for you because you're more familiar with this stuff than most of our guests. Uh, If you believe in it, you're going to say believe it. If you don't believe it or skeptical, you say bullshit. This is a game called Bullshit or Believe It. All right. This is is going to be a trouble for me. It's fine. (laughs) I know. It's trouble for everyone, but this is going to be real fascinating. Okay, Okay. here we go. All right. On your mark. Get set. Ghosts. Bullshit. UFOs. Bullshit. Bigfoot. Bullshit. Little gray aliens. Bullshit. Out of body experiences. Bullshit. Demonic possession. Bullshit. The Bermuda Triangle. Bullshit. Alien abductions. Bullshit. Loch Ness Monster. Bullshit. Time travel. Bullshit. Mothman. Bullshit. Reincarnation. Bullshit. ESP. Bullshit. Haunted houses. Bullshit. The Illuminati. Bullshit. There's a face on Mars. Bullshit. Skunk ape. Bullshit. Heaven. Bullshit. Hell. Bullshit. Sea serpents. Bullshit. Poltergeist. (laughs) Bullshit. Chupacabra. Bullshit. Atlantis. Bullshit. Life on other planets. Bullshit. (laughs) Parallel dimensions. Believe it. Wow. The apocalypse. Bullshit. Life after death. Bullshit. <laughs> now, I'm so glad we did that. Bryce, are you I'm, okay? Yeah, he's like he's like my anathema. He's like he's like I'm I'm all believe it, he's all bullshit. I that's incredible. I wasn't expecting that. That really threw me for a looper. That's amazing. Well, so this is why I said this is gonna be hard for me. Yeah. Because one of the things that uh, Craig, my mentor, really beat into me and, and some of my other mentors that I've had over the years was if I'm going to be honest mm-hmm. with my research and with myself and my experiences to make the declaratory statement that you believe something is the path that you don't want to be on oh, because there you be- go because because beliefs are concreted and they do not change. You can have ideas about them, but as soon as you start to know the answer, you've lost the path. Belief is the enemy, John Keel. Yes, yes, absolutely. Fantastic, I love it. But you're convinced on parallel dimensions. What, what, what? I mean, on your one, believe it. What, what brought you over <laughs> to that side? Uh, just because I have a strange and startling feeling that there is a, a fourth or a fifth dimension. I'm fairly aware of three, uh, and so for there to be a fourth or a fifth seems like a very, very good possibility. Mm. I like it. I like the way you think, John Tenney. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about some high strangeness happening in Michigan right now. All right, we're back. We're talking to John E.L. Tenney, paranormal investigator researcher. Um, John, so you mentioned before the record that there's some stuff uh, involving some high strangeness, I should say, involving humanoids and cryptids happening in Michigan right now that you're working on. Yeah, so I got a report, I got two at the end of 2017, of some people in this neighborhood who saw a weird creature. And they described it as looking like a two foot by two foot silver box covered in hair. Whoa. That was floating through... (laughs) That was floating through the neighborhood, and uh, one of the witnesses, they lived across the street from each other. Uh, One of the witnesses, they hadn't known each other before this either, which is really interesting. They both saw it and then came out and talked to each other about it. Uh, But one of them uh, saw it pass through a car, 
So it came down the street, went through a car, and then came out the other side. And then the neighbor who followed it as it moved through backyards saw it passing through fences. So it was kind of non-corporeal. Wow. Um, so cool. So I started researching them. And, and then in January, I got another case of someone seeing something really strange. It wasn't a box covered with hair. It was... <laughs> Uh, a, a like a three foot in diameter disc that was floating about a foot off of the ground and it was covered in what looked like LED lights. And I thought, well, maybe that's a drone or something. Yeah. Like that. And so I went out and a family had seen it and they had their kids sketch it. And one of the kids sketched it with a face. And I said, well, what's this face on it? And they said, well, it had a face on it and it turned and looked at us before it disappeared. And I said, well, you mean it disappeared? And they were like, it just kind of disappeared. It just vanished. We watched it. It turned and looked at us. We were looking at it through the window in our living room. And then it vanished. Well, that throughout the course of 2018, I collected about 45 cases of creatures or beings or something that just their morphology, the, the way that they're shaped changes. And they just act insane. They, from uh, one man in northern Michigan who saw this being that he said was like 11 feet tall, uh, had one leg and three arms, and was about three inches in diameter, and it was kind of hopping through his field. <laughs> God. So, <I> mean, <clears throat> and then, and then by, by the uh, beginning of 2019, stopped, all gone, nothing. Wow. So this is going on for about two years. About a year and a half, yeah. Year and a half. The do you face, ever feel, oh, I was going to well, say, just, like, do you ever feel like the stranger it is sometimes that you, your truth meter goes off? Like, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Well, that's one of the things that, uh, as a researcher, that I get so fascinated about is why would someone make up something so insane? Like, why wouldn't you just say you saw an alien or UFO? Why are you telling me about this 12-foot tall, 30-inch in diameter, one-legged hopping pole creature? Instead yeah. of telling me about a gray, like, because they saw something that just completely flipped their lid. And so I do think that those experiences have something much more interesting going on. And I think that, I mean, for as crazy as it all sounds like, I think that this was probably the same experience, just being experienced differently by different people all across the state of Michigan. This encompasses the UP to the lower half of Michigan. And I think it was happening all over the country, but I just have trouble. It took me a, a year and a half to convince a lot of these people to talk to me. And I had to, wow. some of them, ha I had to have them sign non-disclosure agreements. So even when I write the book that I've been working on, um, I can't use their real name because they don't want their neighbors to know they were seeing crazy stuff. Uh, but I, I think too, a lot of times people see really weird, high strangeness stuff and then just don't report it because they don't want people to think that they're insane. I have yeah. two questions for you. The first is, what did the face on that disc that the kid saw, what did that look like? Was it human-like or whatever? And then second, how did you find these cases? So the cases mostly came to me through email. A couple of people called the number that I leave out publicly for people to leave messages on. And then some people contacted me through Twitter uh, and Facebook. Uh, the face on that thing looked like its mouth looked like Jordy LaForge's eyeglasses. <laughs> so kind of a band with really small strips. And then yeah. it had two eyes. Uh, and one of the eyes, <laughs> for as odd as this sounds, one of the eyes was like softball sized. And the other eye was like, like ping pong ball sized. <laughs> Amazing. And are they glowing? <laughs> are they the classic glowing red eyes? Are they humanoid? Nope, they, they eyeballs out of their sockets is the kind of way it was described. Wow. That almost oh. looks like you're peeking at something. You know, like, you know, like when you see, oh boy, how am I going to describe this? But you know, like when they run programs of like, okay, here's, here's what a room looks like. And now here's what it looks like in a fractal pattern. And it's sort of like a kaleidoscope version of the image or object you're looking at. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm remembering things from like high school and, and um, yeah. college, like science. It sounds like you're seeing something from angles that you're not supposed to be see seeing it, you know, or like when you you're playing a video game and suddenly you're inside the avatar and you can kind of see back behind the character's eyes and it all looks really fucked up. Yeah. Um, 
Age. Well, and you know what else too, Michael? It's like, listen, the brain is such a complex organism and and when it witnesses something it's not supposed to have any knowledge of or something it's never seen before, it, it, it can only work so hard to receive what it's actually perceiving. So, you know, like John said, all these all these witnesses might have been seeing the same quote unquote uh source of manifestation. They're just they're just receiving it uh all differently and their brain is trying to catch up to just what it is it's visually looking at well yeah and that's a good point too because you know one of the kind of anecdotal historical accounts that we have of uh like native americans and aboriginal people and and tribes when they're first exposed to mirrors like a simple mirror they can't they can't see their reflection because they've only ever seen themselves in the reflection of water which is moving Right. And so to see a stationary, non moving picture of themselves, they can't even recognize their own face because that's not how you look in a reflection. Yeah. Um, I I think this is similar. Whatever, whatever's happening in in Michigan, I I think you're right. I think it's whatever that one thing is that's uh, that's moving its way through through there. It's wild. Yeah. I didn't even know. Like, so the working title of the book that I have right now is just the Formanauts. Because I didn't know what to call them. And it's Fantas- just- that was my next question. What do you call these things? <laughs> I, I call them formanauts. Uh, just obviously Latin. So forma meaning form and knots meaning sailors. It's like people just taking on form. Wow. Uh, for whatever reason. I have a question. You know, so we always we always scoop everything under an umbrella term of the phenomenon. In your what I, expert opinion, do you think there are multiple phenomenons like uh, – I know that's individualistic, but you have phenomenon one over here, phenomenon two over here, phenomenon three over here, or is it all still part of the same thing? The way that I've always talked about it in lectures is that you can study the individual tentacles, but they're all connected to the octopus. I see. If I were George Norrie, uh, Mr. Tenney, I would ask you this. Now, these formanauts, <laughs> what do they want with us? Uh, a lot of the time, I think it can be simple as simple as uh, those two neighbors didn't know each other and now they're friends. Mm. Like, I, oh. I, think, I, I think that it can be something as simple as that. I think that it can be someone who wasn't. This happened a lot with the people that I talked to, people who went outside of their comfort zone to talk deeply and honestly about something very strange to a stranger. So it's uh, not just fighting for space. Right. I think that those, uh, those what seem minimal steps are enormous for some people. In your uh, research, have you discovered, I mean, obviously we've come up multiple times with links between big hairy monsters and portals and UFOs or flying saucers, discs, whatever. Have you encountered anything in your research that combines the traits of those in the way this does? You know, a weird silver box that also has uh, big hairy monster attributes. Um, I mean, it, it it does tend to happen in the in when you research that you find all of these crossovers, I mean, I don't know who all of your guests have been, but you know, people who see Bigfoot, they see green flashes of light in the sky that look like the green fireballs that people reported as UFOs. Like uh, there are people who have seen Bigfoot, but it's wearing clothes. There are people who see dog man, you know, most mm-hmm. of the reports of dog man report him more as a werewolf because he's wearing pants. Mm. Uh, we, we've actually had uh, Linda Godfrey on the show a couple times talking about the Beast of Bray Road and Dogman. Yeah, Linda is great. We did uh, the first annual Dogman Symposium. It was the only one ever, actually, uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago. <laughs> uh, but we did it in Defiance, Ohio, where people saw the Dogman and he was wearing you know, a flannel shirt and ripped up pants and looked more like a wolf man than a dogman, wow. which was interesting, too, because that tied in... I did some research before we did the convention and I found out that there was this movie that came out. uh, It was called moon of the wolf in the 1970s. And it was about this werewolf that attacked people on train tracks, which is where uh, the defiance Ohio case happened on train tracks. It was this wolf man kind of, and I was like, Oh, so what happened was people saw the movie and then they told this story about being attacked on the tracks by a werewolf. The problem is, is moon of the wolf uh, came out, about four weeks after the 
uh, events in Defiance, Ohio, uh, which means that the movie had been made, but no one had ever seen it uh, when the reports came in. So there was wow. a really weird, like, synchronicity, coincidence type of thing that happened there as well. God. Do you, th- do you think I- that we've 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 talked we were talking about this a little bit um, um amongst ourselves with uh, after reading mothman that like it sometimes feels that like wh- whatever this phenomenon is wherever it's coming from feels like it is coming from the same place where we get our archetypes and our myths and our dream symbology you know it when we fall asleep and we dream or when we tell stories is it possible that we're just tapping into the same source at all of the that this phenomena is coming through is it one and the same or do they inform one another uh, you know there seems to be some correlation between the two yeah i think i think that they I think it is a, a kind of closed system. I think that we're feeding the archetypes and they're feeding back to us and that they mm. grow and expand and evolve just the way that we do. And sometimes they're growing and evolving backwards. And, and uh, I, I think that we're all in this together and we're all figuring it out in our own way. And I think that sometimes the universe throws you a curveball like a giant floating hairy box that moves through <laughs> cars and stuff. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it just gives you a knock on a table. But, you know, even in a, in a more defined sense of how much are we influencing each other or the phenomenon itself, I've argued for decades now that people who investigate haunted houses if you did historical research on the house, I'm really interested in haunted houses where people have historically for a hundred years or 200 years seen weird lights in the house. I think Mm -hmm. that's a really interesting thing for me because I wonder often if the lights that they're seeing a hundred years ago are us investigating for ghosts now because we carry, we carry around all of these flashing buzzing lights and all these little machines and how do we know that what they saw a hundred years ago wasn't our EMF detector, which made them start saying that the house was haunted. And now a hundred years later, we're investigating the house because of ourselves. I, I think, I think you're right. I think time, oh. I think time is a cornerstone to figuring out this phenomenon. And and that brings me to my next question. Is there, is there ever any figuring out of this phenomenon? In other words, if this wasn't such a taboo subject for our cutting edge scientists, do you think that we could ever get to the bottom of what this is? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think for me personally, when I think about this, I, uh, in a book that I wrote a uh, 10 years ago or something, uh, I wrote at the very end and I, I won't be as succinct as the way that I wrote it, but, uh, I said something to the effect of if someday in the future, our it, intelligence and technology has allowed us to count the stars, to discern the existence of life after death to number the molecules and atoms in the universe. Once we know everything and everything is known, what will be the point of anything even being? Um, Amen. Right? So it's, I, I think that there's no figuring it out because, again, it's the journey. It's the quest that keeps us going. It's the questions that keep us moving. There will always be more questions. And I think that that's how I, I love that. I, th- I think that's beautiful. I've I. I yeah, I think that's beautiful. I've often said I, I don't really need the answers. It's the it's the questions that that keep my life interesting and and, and keep it fresh and crisp. So I, I think that's beautifully put. I talk to people all the time uh, about their ghost and UFO experiences, and I tell people, even if there are no ghosts, if there are no UFOs, if there are no Bigfoot, if those things and all of the high strangeness is merely a mechanism for talking openly, honestly, and deeply with each other, then it's still vastly important. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the philosophy behind this podcast. I mean, you know, other than, you know, just being entertained by the stories and joking around is just, you know, these topics and, you know, kind of, um, you know, calling back to this conversation, you know, this theory about the, these formonauts getting two neighbors together it really does bring people closer together, you know, in a very practical yeah. way. You know, it's not just chatting about the weather. You know, you really do start to think more deeply about the fabric of reality itself and what our relationship is to one another. Well, and it's yeah. great for guys like me who are terrible at small talk. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> 
Um, it is a good. So, it is a good. It is a good uh, icebreaker at bars, and you know. <laughs> Are you still in touch with the families that encountered these formanots in in Michigan? Yes, absolutely. And have they experienced any poltergeist activity in their houses since then? Any weird lights? Any knocks? Any objects moving around the house? Nope. Uh, and they're on strict uh, command to call me and keep me informed if anything happens to them, and nothing. Wow, that's good. No shadow people, no nothing. No, you know, it's interesting too, uh, just as a side note, because you mentioned shadow people. uh, Again, when we talk about being informed by our concepts and and the biases that we bring along with us, uh, I live in Royal Oak, which is 35 minutes away from Dearborn, Michigan. Dearborn Mm -hmm. is the largest Middle Eastern community outside of the Middle East. And uh, so I deal with gin a lot. Uh, mm, instead, of, uh, instead of ghosts, I deal with gin because of the Middle Eastern community. But I have also, for years and years and years, been subject to the idea of Middle Eastern ideas of shadow people, which are not bad. Uh, they're not evil. They are the silhouette of your loved ones coming from heaven to give you a message. And they, and they look dark and shadowy because the light of heaven is behind them. Mm. And so I've always found it interesting that shadow people have always been portrayed in television and movies as evil, demonic entities, when there's an entire huge culture of people who believe that they are loved ones coming back to inform us and visit us. That wow. still doesn't explain the hats. What's up with the hats? <laughs> what is up with the hats? Uh, I don't know. Hat men and hat ghosts are very strange to me. Uh, I love uh, voodoo and I, I love ideas like Baron Somdi walking around with his top hat. Uh, but I have, <laughs> I, have, I have no idea. And does it tie into why the men in black wear hats? You know, That's maybe, what I maybe it's hard to it. comb ghost hair. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maybe. You just get one when you go to heaven. They're like, welcome to heaven. Here's your I, wide brim hat. There's a hat I, shop. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, because I try and be silly a lot of the times in my lectures, I actually try and get people to think deeper by talking about weird concepts like not the hat. But I tell people all the time about ghost underwear. Like I'm, I've kind of got this fascination with it because if you see a go ghost. Go on. <laughs> if, if you see a ghost and it's wearing a dress, if it's a female wearing a dress, then she's also wearing underwear. And that just seems really strange to me because that would mean that she's putting clothes on instead of Mm -hmm. just kind of forming them. And that means she's expending extra energy to put a thing on that you won't see anyway. Right. And (laughs) and so then you start to wonder about ghost clothing in a whole. Like when people see Civil War ghosts or say that they see Civil War ghosts, like who sewed the coats that they're wearing? Who sewed? And is there something in their ghost pockets? It's like, how much attention do they want to put into the detail? Right. And could you form what you're wearing right now simply by thinking about it? Could you draw perfectly? You know, could you describe it perfectly just in voice? Uh, do you know how many stitches are on the seams of your pants or do you know how, what the imprint on the button of your pants is, but you know, all that stuff would have to be there if they're, if they're literally wearing clothes. It's wild. That's you know, I, I think about like imagining the future and or, or like imagining plans for something. And it o- it always remains a little bit fuzzy, you know, and it's supposed to be like that. It's never supposed to be concrete in order for it to manifest. It has to remain uh, a little bit blurry, a little bit fuzzy in your mind's eye. Right. I, Which is how all of this stuff appears to us. I guess I've always thought about the ghost clothes as kind of like when you look at a photograph, right? You know, everything in a picture of a person, it's like, yeah, my wallet's in my pocket in this picture, but you just can't see it. But because it's just a two dimensional image, is the wallet really there? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's basic. You're just seeing the representation of the object that was there. So I, I don't, I don't know. I guess I've always thought of like ghosts and apparitions in that sense that it's a representation of well, that's- something. That's why I've argued at lectures and or discussed at lectures the fact that you're seeing ghosts. Everything you've ever seen uh, has never you've never seen it outside of yourself. The, the yeah. light, and the shape, and shadow has bounced in through your eyes, gone through your visual centers, and then reformed it into your brain. And your brain told you it was outside of yourself. Everything you've ever seen has been in your head, and. Yeah. So I feel like the most common ghost that people see when when people say, oh, I saw grandpa, he was wearing his fishing hat, grandma had her best dress on. I don't, if we're seeing ghosts, 
I don't think they're manifesting out in the air in front of us. I think they're doing something far more inter interesting and intimate. I think they're looking through our memories. They're finding visual representations of themselves. And then if, instead of expending all of this energy to create themselves outside, yeah. they're simply switching a switch in your head. And then all of a sudden there's grandma, there's grandpa, and they look just like they always did. John, one time I was in uh, this, it's a longer story, but I was staying at this giant like colonial farmhouse in upstate New York outside Albany. And this place just felt like Grand Central Station. I, it felt like my room was full of 15 fucking people at any given point when I was trying to go to sleep. This place felt super, super active. And I got up in the middle of the night to use the hallway bathroom and when you walked outside, there was this like large uh, sort of banister, rectangular banister that overlooked the center of the house. And across the um, opening on the other side of the banister in the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a woman in a long uh, crimson kind of or like red dress, kind of like a Scarlett O'Hara kind of look pass through the hallway. And I quickly pulled out my, I think I had like a Blackberry at the time and snapped a picture. And when I looked at the picture, there wasn't a woman, but where the woman was, there was a tiny uh, blue orb that, you know, pinprick of a light that you could see there. And it always made me wonder, you know, that thing that you're talking about was, was she, was the, or was the orb the real thing or was the woman in the dress the real thing and the camera could only see an orb and I could only see the woman in the dress out of the corner of my eye. Mm, I love it. Different love instrumentation. It. Yeah. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Allowing you to see, I mean, we have so many different, we're, first of all, we're so limited in ourselves of what kind of sound spectrum we can hear and what kind of light spectrum we can see. In. And then you add technology into it, which is seeing and hearing in different spectrums as well. Like, I love it. I love it. Oh man, wow. we love it too. I, well, unfortunately, we have to wrap this episode up. Um, but uh, I mean, we could talk to you forever, John. This is so awesome. Thank you so much. Where where can people find you? Uh, when is the Formanots book going to come out? So Formanots should be out by the end of this year. Uh, people wanted it out earlier, and I tell them like I'm just a ADD researcher, so it takes me a little bit longer to put everything together. Uh, but people can find me on Twitter, John E.L. Tenney, and Facebook, John E.L. Tenney, and Instagram, John E.L. Tenney. I've tried to make it pretty simple for people. You can basically go on Google and type T-E-N-N-E-Y and weirdo after it and just pop, <laughs> follow, follow that wherever it leads. Fantastic. Well, thank wow. you so much for being part of the show. Um, guys, uh, if you're listening at home, uh, you can check out our um, our Patreon page at uh, patreon.com, Bigfoot Collectors Club, The Other Side. We're talking about the Mothman prophecies this week. And then uh, do us a favor, if you could, um, as you're listening, go to Apple Podcasts and please give us a five-star review so we can get the show to more people. If you leave us a five-star review, we'll read some of our favorites right here on the show. Uh, uh, here's a recent one that's here's a sample of what you can write. Um, uh, spooky, scary, super funny. Five stars by Brujo Sereno. This is from April 1st. And he wrote, these nerds are a hoot. Occasionally really out there and other times just super funny. These guys are a great team. That's the exact type of quality review we're looking for. So please uh, <laughs> head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a review over there. Um, and uh, until next time, uh, I remain Michael McMillan for Bryce Johnson and Riley Bray. Thanks again to John E. L. Tenney. And uh, until next week, good night. And go get regressed. Wow. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club.